This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 5 for April 24 to 30, Children of the Promise, and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised that you will always be there with us. And we thank you that we can always look and see that you are always faithful. And as we open your word this week, as we look at what your word says to us, as we listen to the Holy Spirit interpreting that word, we pray that our hearts may be opened, our minds clear, and that our spiritual life may be positive, and that our family, our community, and our church may be benefited by this lesson today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew 28, verse 20. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Let's read that again, Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. A father and his ten-year-old daughter were spending their holiday at the seashore. One day they went out to enjoy a swim in the ocean, and although they were both good swimmers, some distance out from the shore they became separated. The father, realising that they were being carried out to sea by the tide, called to his child, Mary, I'm going to shore for help. If you get tired, turn on your back. You can float all day that way. I'll come back for you. HMS Richards Jr., writing in the Voice of Prophecy News in an article titled When Jesus Comes Back in March 1949, page 5, reads Before long, many searchers and boats were scurrying over the face of the water, hunting for one small girl. Hundreds of people on the shore had heard the news and were waiting anxiously. It was four hours before they found her, far from land, but she was calmly floating on her back and not at all frightened. Cheers and tears of joy and relief greeted the rescuers when they came back to land with their precious burden, but the child took it all calmly. She seemed to think it was strange the way they acted. She said, Father said I could float all day on my back and that he would come for me, so I just swam and floated, because I knew he'd come. And now for the week at a glance. Why did the Lord refer to himself as Abram's shield? How were all the families of the earth to be blessed through Abraham? And what is the greatest of all the covenant promises? Sunday, April 25. Thy shield. Our text for today is Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Question, read Genesis 15 verses 1 through to 3. Think of the context in which this message was given. Why would the first thing the Lord says to Abram be, Fear not? What would Abram have to fear? God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, What will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. What's particularly interesting here is that the Lord says to Abram, I am thy shield. The use of the personal pronouns shows the personal nature of the relationship. God will relate to him one-on-one, the way he will to all of us. 
The designation of God as a shield appears here for the first time in the Bible, and is the only time God uses it to reveal himself, even if other biblical passages use the term to speak about God. As we read in Deuteronomy 33:29, Happy are you, O Israel! Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help, and the sword of your majesty? Your enemies shall submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. And Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect, the word of the Lord is proven, he is a shield to all who trust in him. And Psalm eighty four eleven, For the Lord God is a sun and shield, the Lord will give grace and glory, no no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And Psalm 144, verse 2. My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. When God calls himself someone's shield, what does he mean? Did it mean something to Abram that it might not mean to us now? Can we claim that promise for ourselves? Does it mean no physical harm will come? In what ways is God a shield? How do you understand that image? In the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 77, Ellen White writes, Christ has not a casual interest in us, but an interest stronger than a mother for her child. Our Saviour has purchased us by human suffering and sorrow, by insult, reproach, abuse, mockery, rejection, and death. He is watching over you, trembling child of God. He will make you secure under his protection. Our weakness in human nature will not bar our access to the Heavenly Father, for he, Christ, died to make intercession for us. End of quote. And so to finish the day, from all outward appearances, Rolando had been a faithful follower of the Lord. Then suddenly he died unexpectedly. What happened to God as his shield? Or must we understand the idea of God as our shield in a different manner? Explain. What does God always promise to shield us from? Well, our answer could be in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Monday, April 26, The Messianic Promise, Part 1 Genesis 28, verse 14 reads, In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Galatians 3.29 reads, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. More than once the Lord said to Abraham that in his seed, his offspring, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. As we read in Genesis 12 verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And chapter 18 verse 18, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And chapter 22 verse 18, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This wonderful covenant promise is repeated because of all the promises, this is the most important one, the most enduring one, the one that makes all the others worthwhile. In one sense, this was a promise of the rise of the Jewish nation, through whom the Lord wanted to teach all the families of the earth about the true God and his plan of salvation. Yet, the promise reaches complete fulfilment only in Jesus Christ, 
who came from the seed of Abraham, the one who would at the cross pay for the sins of all the families of the earth. Think about the covenant promise made after the flood in which the Lord promised not to destroy the world with water again. What ultimate good would this be without the promise of redemption found in Jesus? What ultimate good would any of God's promises be without the promise of eternal life found in Christ? How do you understand the notion that in Abraham, through Jesus, all the families of the earth would be blessed? What does this mean? No question, the covenant promise of the world's Saviour is the greatest of all God's promises. The Redeemer himself becomes the means by which the obligations of all the covenant arrangement are met and all of its other promises are realised. All, Jew or Gentile, who enter into union with him are recounted as Abraham's true family and inheritors of the promise, as we read in Galatians 3 verses 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And the same chapter, Galatians 3, verses 27 to 29. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the promise of eternal life in a sinless environment where evil, pain and suffering will never again rise. Can you think of a better promise than that? So to finish today, what is it about the promise of eternal life in a world without sin and suffering that has such an attraction for us? Could it be that we long for it because that's what we were originally created for? And that by longing for it, we are longing for something that is basic to our nature? Tuesday, April 27, The Messianic Promise, Part 2 Thomas Brown wrote, To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country, and even out of ourselves. Question. Look at what that above quote, written in the 1600s. Do you agree or disagree? Read it in the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, and Revelation 3, verse 12. I'll read it again. To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country and even out of ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And Revelation 3 verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Augustine wrote of the human condition, This life of ours, if a life so full of such great ills can properly be called a life, bears witness to the fact that, from its very start, the race of mortal men has been a race condemned. 
Think first of the dreadful abyss of ignorance from which all error flows and so engulfs the sons of Adam in a darksome pool that no one can escape without the toll of toils and tears and fears. Then take our very love for all those things that prove so vain and poisonous and breed so many heartaches, troubles, griefs and fears, such insane joys in discord, strife and wars, such fraud and theft and robbery that perfidy and pride, envy and ambition, homicide and murder, cruelty and savagery, lawlessness and lust, all the shameless passions of the impure, fornication and adultery, incest and unnatural natural sins, rape and countless other uncleannesses too nasty to be mentioned, the sins against religion, sacrilege and heresy, blasphemy and perjury, the iniquities against our neighbours, calumnies and cheating, lies and false witness, violence to persons and property, the injustices of the courts and the innumerable other miseries and maladies that fill the world, yet escape attention. End of quote. Augustine's quote could apply to most modern cities today, yet he wrote it more than 1500 years ago. Little about humanity has changed, which is why people want an escape. Fortunately, however tough our situation now, the future is bright, but only because of what God did for us through the life, death, resurrection and high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, the ultimate fulfilment of the covenant promise made to Abraham that, in his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so to finish the day, look at the quote from Augustine. Write something in your own words to describe the sad situation in the world today. At the same time, look up whatever Bible text you can find that talk about what God has promised us in Jesus Christ. Dwell on those promises. Make them your own. Only then can you truly grasp what the covenant is all about. And those promises we find in Isaiah 25 and verse 8. He will swallow up death for ever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And finally, Revelation 22, verses 2 to 5, In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign for ever and ever. Wednesday, April 28, a great and mighty nation. Not only did God promise Abraham that in him would all the families of the earth be blessed, but the Lord also said that he would make of him a great and mighty nation, as we read in Genesis eighteen eighteen. since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And Genesis 12, verse 2, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And Genesis 46, verse 3, So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. Well, that's quite a promise to a man married to a woman past childbearing age. Thus, when Abraham was without descendants, much less a son, 
God promised him both. Yet this promise was not completely fulfilled while Abraham was alive. In fact, neither Isaac nor Jacob saw it come to pass. God repeated it to Jacob with the added information that the promise would be fulfilled in Egypt, as we read in Genesis 46 verse 3. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. Though Jacob did not see it. Eventually, of course, that promise was fulfilled. Question, why did the Lord want to make a special nation out of Abraham's seed? Did the Lord just want another country of a certain ethnic origin? What purposes was this nation to fulfil? Read Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3, and Deuteronomy 4 verses 6 to 8. Write out your answer on the lines below. First of all, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. And Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And... What great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? It seems evident from Scripture that God purposed to attract the nations of the world to himself through the witness of Israel, which would be, under his blessing, a happy, healthy and holy people. Such a nation would demonstrate the blessing that attends obedience to the will of the Creator. The multitudes of earth would be drawn to worship the true God, as we read in Isaiah 56 and verse 7, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Thus the attention of humanity would be drawn toward Israel, their God, and the Messiah, who is to appear in their midst, the Saviour of the world. And from the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 290, we read, The children of Israel were to occupy all the territory which God appointed them. Those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed. But it was God's purpose that by the revelation of His character through Israel, men should be drawn unto Him. To all the world the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before the nations, and all who would look unto him should live. So to finish today, can you see any parallels between what the Lord wanted to do through Israel and what he wants to do through our church? If so, what are these parallels? Read First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light.
Thursday, April 29. Make your name great. Genesis 12 verse 2 reads, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. In Genesis chapter 12 verse 2, God promises to make Abram's name great, that is, to make him famous. Why would the Lord want to do that for any sinner, no matter how obedient and faithful? Who deserves a great name? Well, let's look at Romans 4 verses 1 to 5. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And James 2, verses 21 and 22 and 3 and 4. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Did God bestow greatness on Abram for his own personal benefit? Or did it represent something else? Explain. And then, compare Genesis 11 verse 4 with Genesis 12 verse 2. What is the big difference between the ideas presented in these texts? In what ways does one represent salvation by works, and the other salvation by faith? Genesis 11 verse 4, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And we'll compare that with Genesis 12 verse 2, I will make of you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. However much the plan of salvation rests upon only the work of Christ in our behalf, we, as recipients of God's grace, are nevertheless still involved. We have a role to play. Our free choice comes into prominence. The drama of the ages, the battle between Christ and Satan, is still being played out in and through us. Both humanity and angels are watching what is happening with us in the conflict, as we read in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Thus, who are we? What we say, what we do, far from having no importance beyond our own immediate sphere, has implications that can, in a sense, reverberate across the universe. By our words, our actions, even our attitudes, we can help bring glory to the Lord who has done so much for us, or we can bring shame upon him and his name. Thus, when the Lord said to Abraham that he would make his name great, he surely was not talking about it in the same way the world talks about someone as having a great name. What makes a great name in the eyes of God is character, faith, obedience, humility and love for others. Traits that might often be respected in the world, but are not usually the factors the world would deem as making someone's name great. And so, to finish today, look at some of the men and women who have great names in the world today, be it actors, politicians, artists, the wealthy, or whoever. What is it about these people that has made them famous? Contrast that with the greatness of Abraham. What does that tell us about how perverted the world's concept of greatness is? How much of that worldly attitude impacts our views of greatness as well?
Friday, April 30. It was no light test, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126, that was thus brought upon Abraham, no small sacrifice that was required of him. But he did not hesitate to obey the call. He had no question to ask concerning the land of promise. God has spoken, and his servant must obey. The happiest place on earth for him was the place where God would have him to be. End of quote. When Abram entered Canaan, the Lord appeared to him and made it clear that he was to sojourn in a land that would be given to his descendants, as you read in Genesis 12, verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God repeated this promise several times. And we'll have a look at some of those in Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. In verse 17, Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And Genesis chapter 15 and verses 13, 16 and 18. Verse 13, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, they will afflict them four hundred years. And verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And verse 18, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And Genesis 17, verse 8, Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And Genesis 28, verses 13 and 15, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. And verse 15, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And then Genesis 35 and verse 12, the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and to your descendants after you, I give this land. Some four hundred years later, in fulfilment of the promise, the Lord announced to Moses that he would bring Israel out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. The promise was in Genesis 15 verse 13 Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And then we read about the land of milk and honey in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And then verse 17. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. And Exodus 6 verse 8, And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. 
God repeated the promise to Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. And in David's day, it was largely but not completely fulfilled, as we read in these following passages. Genesis 15 verses 18 to 21. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I will give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And Second Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 14. After this it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Emma from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab, forcing them down to the ground. He measured them off with a line. With two lines he measured off those to be put to death and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took with him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for one hundred chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed twenty-three, twenty-two thousand of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Berathai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram his son to King David to greet him and bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him, for Hadadezer had been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. From Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants, and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And First Kings chapter 4 and verse 21. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And First Chronicles chapter 19, and there we read verses 1 to 19. It happened after this that Nahash, the king of the people of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came to Hanun in the land of the people of Ammon to comfort him. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanun, Do you think that David really honours your father because he has sent comforters to you? Did his servants not come to you to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? Therefore Hanun took David's servants, shaved them, and cut off their garments in the middle, at their buttocks, and sent them away. Then some went and told David about the men, and he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Wait at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. 
When the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, Hanun and the people of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for themselves chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Syrian Makkah, and from Zobah. So they hired for themselves thirty-two thousand chariots, with the king of Makkah and his people, who came and encamped before Mediba. Also the people of Ammon gathered together from their cities and came to battle. Now when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. Then the people of Ammon came out and put themselves in battle array before the gate of the city, and the kings who had come were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the battle line was against him before and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai his brother, and they set themselves in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be of good courage, and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is right in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. When the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai, his brother, and, the, and entered the city. So Joab went to Jerusalem. Now, when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they sent messengers and brought the Syrians who were before the river, and Shokak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, went before them. When it was told David, he gathered all Israel, crossed over the Jordan, and came upon them, and set up a battle, set up in battle array against them. So when David had set up in battle array against the Syrians, they fought with him. Then the Syrians fled before Israel, and David killed 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians, and killed Shophak, the commander of the army. And when the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and became his servants. So the Syrians were not willing to help the people of Ammon. Any more. Now read Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, and 13 to 16. These verses make it clear that Abraham and the other faithful patriarchs viewed Canaan as a symbol or a foreshadowing of the ultimate settled home of God's redeemed people. Hebrews 11 verses 9 and 10. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And then verses 13 to 17. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In the sin situation, no permanent home is possible. Life is fleeting like a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, it says in James 4.14. As the spiritual descendants of Abraham, we too must realise that here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come, as we've just read in Hebrews 13, verse 14. The certainty of the future life with Christ keeps us steady in this present world of change and decay. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, what effect should God's promise of a new earth have on our personal Christian experience? And we'll compare some texts here. First of all, Matthew 5. And verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And 2 Corinthians 4, 
verses 17 and 18, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Revelation 21 verses 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And Revelation 22 verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And discussion question two. True greatness was to result from compliance with God's commands and cooperation with his divine purpose. What does this statement from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 293, mean? And to summarise this week's lesson... Promises, how precious they are to the believer. Will they be fulfilled? Faith answers yes. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Trusting God or Science, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. The physician showed the 3D ultrasound images to Dr. Hernando Diaz. You're a physician, he said. Here is the evidence. End the pregnancy. Hernando's pregnant wife, Erica, wept. The images showed that their baby had Potter's syndrome, a rare condition associated with kidney failure, abnormal limbs and an unusual facial appearance, including widely separated eyes. As a physician, Hernando understood that the physician was right. But, as a Christian, he wondered what to do. The baby wouldn't live if the 32-week pregnancy were ended, but there might be hope if they waited. Should he trust science or God? God will have the last word, he said. Complications beset the pregnancy, and the physician recommended a caesarean section to save Erica's life. Hernando and Erica prayed. Their church prayed. Family and hospital staff rebuked Erica for not ending the pregnancy. Two days before the caesarean section, a 3D ultrasound showed that nothing had changed. That night, Erica had a dream. She saw a baby boy playing in a basket and heard a voice telling her husband, Take your son. He is a gift from God. You shall name him Samuel David. Raise him according to God's word. Erica and Hernando took the dream as a sign that the baby might survive. They bought baby supplies for the first time. The next day, however, they braced for the worst. The physician said that he would do the caesarean section, cut the umbilical cord and expect the baby to die within minutes. Caesarean sections usually take 20 to 30 minutes. Hernando waited in the waiting room for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. His anxiety grew as 60 minutes passed. Suddenly he heard screams. They weren't his wife's. They weren't their babies. They were the sound of the physician and nurses screaming in surprise. They had expected a formed baby, but instead found a perfect baby boy. It is impossible, the physician exclaimed. This is a miracle. The parents determined to raise Samuel David according to God's word, and today they credit him for leading them and many others to Jesus. While seeking medical treatment for the boy's subsequent kidney problems, they learned about and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, Hernando works as a physician at the Adventist Medical Centre on the campus of Columbia Adventist University in Medellin, Colombia. Samuel is a healthy eight-year-old boy. 
we decided to trust in God, even though almost everyone was against us, said Hernando 60. And there's a lovely photo of Hernando smiling here on the left. God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Many people have come to the feet of Jesus after hearing Samuel's story. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a missionary training centre at Columbia Adventist University in Columbia, South America. This lesson was read by Dr Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.